somebody's praying I can feel it Somebody's praying for me Mighty hands are guiding me To protect me from what I can't see Lord, I believe, Lord, I believe, somebody's praying for me. Angels are watching, I can feel it. Angels are watching over me. There's many miles ahead till I get home. Still I'm safely kept before your throne. Cause Lord, I Hi folks, I'm Ricky Skaggs, and welcome to the Ryman Auditorium, which began as a church and is still considered by many people to be the mother church of country music. You know, there's always been a close connection between country music and the church. Most artists got their start singing gospel songs, and ironically, most early country stars' goals were to make it right here, and this connection is still continuing. Revival is happening in country music right now as new and established artists alike step out with their faith, proclaiming the gospel and their commitment to Jesus Christ. The last few months have been tremendous as we've had a chance to visit with several country stars and talk about their faith and their Christian roots. We ask each one of them to contribute one song that was close to their heart and then share some stories and feelings behind the song. We started in Branson, Missouri with Glenn Campbell in his beautiful new theater, Glenn has been delivered from a life of darkness, and he was sure thrilled to talk about it. You know, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is older, he will return to it. And that's really the story of, uh, of me. Uh, I had to uh, do something. I, was, I had been running amok for, I don't know, six, seven years, I guess. And uh, I was watching Dr. Gene Scott in Los Angeles. I'd be laying there and I'd be either drunk or high and, or both. And he would come on late night and uh, he'd teach the Bible. He had a double bill cap on and uh, smoked a, a, a big pipe or, he'd be, or a cigar. And he just looked, you know, I said, hey, there's a hip guy, man, you know. <laughs> but it didn't matter what he looked like. He was teaching the Word of God and he was really getting it across to Glenn Campbell. Whether he, uh, whether he could have been, if he'd have been dressed like what I would call straight, you know, if he'd have been there in a suit and a tie and, you know, slick back hair and talking to him, I probably wouldn't have caught my eye or caught my attention. But it was just something like abstract. Maybe, you know, there's a reason for everything. God put him there for me to see at that particular time in my life. I know he did. <laughs> because when, when God wants you, he, he gets you. I got down to the point where I had to reach up to touch bottom, it felt like. And everybody else to the outside world other than to the rag magazine readers, uh, you know, it was, everything was cool. I was live, having a high time, but I wasn't having a high time. I was having a horrible time. Uh, December the 22nd of 1981 was when I was baptized again. God tells me, I must go get baptized. I must be saved. I started uh, trying my best to live for the Lord. I was still drinking. I, I was still smoking. And uh, drugs went. But it took me a while to, to shake the alcohol. I've been abstinent seven years now. I quit smoking three years ago. I mean, when Jesus Christ delivers you from something, you are delivered. You don't want it anymore. <laughs> if it was good for you, he wouldn't deliver from you in the first place, you know. I don't miss alcohol. Well, I don't miss 
cigarettes. I don't miss any vice that I had before. I wondered why I was stupid enough to do them in the first place, because it seemed like the thing to do at the time or because other people were doing it. Uh, and Paul was so right when he wrote, uh, you know, when we're baby Christians, we need the milk of the word. I think it's probably what's wrong with a lot of people who become Christians. They're still Christians, but they, 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 you, you'll hit a, a, a plateau, and then it's, you want something more. So that's when you've got to get off of the milk and the pablum and start really getting into God's word, start reading, start studying the Bible. We have to follow Jesus Christ as Christians, and the freedom, the freedom is just so incredible. You know, and <laughs> ask and thou you, you shall receive. Knock, the door will open. Seek and you shall find. People don't do that. The, the minute the crisis comes, it's, oh my God, what am I going to do now? Oh Lord, help me. Oh, what? Instead of asking for something, because Jesus says that. I think I minister to people right here on the show. I have so many people come up and say how, what an astounding effect uh, the four horsemen have on them, and no more night. Uh, just, and it really thrills my heart. It's right out of Revelations. The whole song, the whole idea for the song is, you know, there'll be no more nights and no more tears. The nations bow down to sing. Uh, earth and heaven will pass away, but there'll be a new earth and a new heaven. The timeless theme, earth and heaven will pass away. It's not a dream, God will make all things new that day. Gone is the curse from which I stumbled and fell.
the whole thing is Jesus Christ. When Jesus said, my yoke is light, oh boy, it's a feather. It, because your yoke is the things you're trying to hide in your life, the things you don't want people to know. Study. Study the Bible. Study other things. See if they coincide with the Bible. And I think that's how you really, really grow in the Lord. And you become so secure in Christ. It's amazing. It's like uh, nothing, nothing phases you except the truth of God. Uh, you, you, can, you can see what goes on around you. You can see the lies. You can see the hypocrisy. It's just amazing to me how God will take you if you come to him with an honest heart and an honest, uh, with a pure heart, I should say. Uh, he teaches you. It's amazing the things that, that I've learned in this, you know, short, I'm 13 years old now. If there's something I'm supposed to be doing now, God's guiding my life. He'll tell me. I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about, oh, gee, I should be doing this, or maybe I should be doing that, or maybe I should have done this. That's what that, when Jesus says, give me your cares, give me your worries. Uh, take, take my yoke. My yoke is light. It is Jesus Christ's yoke is lighter than air. When you take that truth, that honesty, that just, that fairness in your life on, uh, boy, it's, you don't worry about all of that stuff that you worried about before. Because you, if there's anything to happen in your life or to be done, you'll know it. He'll tell you. The ultimate compliment will be Jesus Christ looking me in the face and saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. That would be the ultimate compliment. Tammy Wynette is a legend. So it was only fitting that she chose the legends of Southern Gospel, the Masters Five, to help her with Precious Memories, a song that has deep meaning for her, and it shows her great love for gospel music. Well, I wanted to uh, record with some of my heroes, uh, Statesman, Blackwood Brothers. So I got some of each, which they're known as the Masters Five. And uh, my husband had known them a lot longer than I had. I had been going to see them in concerts for years, but he was a, a gospel piano player, keyboard player for years, and he knew all of them much better than I did. So uh, I wanted them to sing with me. So we got them to agree to come in and do Precious Memories, because that's my favorite hymn. It's been sung at a, uh, when my mother died, uh, it was sung at her funeral, when my dad died, it was sung at his funeral. And it's just a, uh, the song is very, uh, it's very close to me. You know, I can identify with that song, I love it. And uh, my husband Richie played the keyboards and it was just perfect, I didn't think we needed anything else. I had uh, J.D. Sumner and Jake Hess and uh, Rosie Roselle and Hovey Lister and it was wonderful. James, James Blackwood. Blackwood. Yeah, I can't leave out James. Uh, and when I get down or depressed, uh, when I was so sick uh, earlier this past year, uh, J.D. Sumner brought the Stamps Quartet down, and they stood at the foot of my bed and sang sung Sweet Holy Spirit. Sweet Holy Spirit. And what a song. It was just incredible. My doctor asked the next day, he said, who was that? He said, I didn't want to come in and interrupt it, but I wanted to hear it again and again and again. But, you know, that's what I want to hear when I'm feeling bad or I'm depressed or something, those old songs just mean the world to me. And I can draw on them and get uh, comfort and, and strength. And then I would ask you, when I'm at home and I sit down to play piano, what do I always play? Oh, uh, you always play Some great old gospel, gospel song. song. So that's where my, where my head is when I'm just wanting to sort of feel, uh, be, be alone and play I have the decided. For, to follow, to follow Jesus. Jesus, that's the one I that he plays all the time. I, I think uh, a wonderful hymn or a gospel song can be many, many times far more effective and reach people without there seeming to be the intent necessarily. You never do a show without doing no. uh, a gospel song no. right now and for a mm -hmm. couple of years it's How Great Thou Art mm -hmm. that you do this in the show and it's probably one of the most well received songs of your entire show including your right. uh, classic hits. Mm -hmm. It's a song. Yeah, I feel strange when I don't do a, a gospel song on the show. It just feels like, well, it's not quite completed uh, because, you know, if not for him, I wouldn't have had my voice anyway. I tell him I'm not the best, I'm just the loudest. But <laughs> uh, I'm very much a believer. Precious 
sing about. They sing about uh, love and heartaches and real things that happen in life. It's country music and gospel music. And we are our, ours is a message of Christ and of hope. But we're still first cousins. Both, both music has always been first cousin. Most every country singer grew up in church. A lot of like country them. singers are Christians now, and the Bible yeah. says training for a child in the way it should grow, and when it grows old, you will not depart from it. And That's right. uh, a lot of these people are led back to the Lord, and it's all gospel music. Yeah. Music has an effect that nothing else has in the world. Absolutely. There's nothing like a song to, to soften the heart. Many people will listen to a song when they won't listen to a sermon. And uh, when we're singing we're actually singing a sermon or singing a testimony or singing about the Lord uh, and it, it blesses people and brings them, brings them back to the Lord if they're not living for Him. I think country music can be the next uh, what means of reaching people for Jesus Christ through country singing. The members of the Masters Five have touched hundreds of thousands of lives and they're continuing to through the tremendous legacy they've left country music. We were really fortunate to have the world's most famous folk artist, the Reverend Howard Finster, to create original works for the album and video cover. Howard was called into sacred art after 45 years of preaching and has touched lives all over the world with award-winning album covers for the Talking Heads, the B-52s, and R.E.M. He was very moved by the music from Silent Witness and especially by Marty Raven's performance of Beulah Land. We had the opportunity to talk with Howard and what happened was a once-in-a-lifetime experience as the thought of Beulah Land moved him to preach. We'll show you this remarkable piece of film, and then we'll take you to Marty Rabin's home church, where he shares not only the memories behind the song, but a powerful testimony of God's faithfulness. And I'm closer to Beulah Land than I've ever been before. I'm not going there for gold streets. I'm not going to Beulah Land just to, to be satisfied and happy. 
because when I get there, what will make Beulah land is to Jesus to be there. If he ain't there, there ain't no heaven there for me, and there ain't no Beulah land there for me. And Beulah land is where Christ is. He is the tree of life. I thought my mother done a lot for me in this world. And I thought my poor father done a lot for me in this world. And all the people I've met along life's way seem like it's been worth a lot to me in this world. But when Jesus Christ went to that cross and died alone for me without his father, he was forsaken. Without his father, he died for me when he could have said, Father, don't do it. But he said, Thy will be done that Howard Fenster uh, might reach the Beulah land and all of the other people. The parable of the, the seed that fell on stony ground pretty much nailed me right down to the wire. I uh, uh, had gotten saved when I was younger and had gotten away from it. And... Uh, then up until about, uh, about four years ago, I came back to know the Lord. And I knew that I needed to be saved because of the way in which I'd lived in between the time of professing to be saved. I'd not come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and for Him to be the Lord of my life. See, I professed it, but I didn't possess it. See, because I used to think that, that if you were a Christian, that, man, that that have to be the boringest thing in the world. You could, you know, there ain't no fun in being no Christian. I mean, what in the world can you do for excitement <laughs> until I come to know Jesus? And then I found out that that uh, that He gives a peace, not as the world gives, but such as I have. Give it unto thee, is what He said. And one great thing about that is more than anything was, I knew I had to come to that point. You know, I, I seen people that 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 had the glory of God on them. You know, I, I seen how they operated in such peace and and they had such a such a sweet loving spirit upon them. My mother was one of them kind. In September of ninety three my mother died of lung cancer. And she'd fought that old ugly mess for about three years. I knew that she was homesick for heaven because she'd been in so much pain for so long, you know. And it's very painful to sit there and watch somebody that you love and care for hurt and ache and you can't do a thing in the world for them. You can't rub their head. You can't rub their feet. You can't take a hold of their hand, you know, and comfort them in any way, you know, without them hurting. She was on this wonderful plan called hospice that she got a chance to be at the house instead of being in the hospital and, and away from her family and, and away from where she really wanted to be. Was around people and, and at home where she she had loved and and everything, but when I got in the room and there, I, I, I got on the bed with her, and I, and I reached over to where she was at, and I kissed her. And I told her, I said, Mother, I love you. And Mama said, I love you too, son. Well, that's about all in the world she had said for the longest. She had not said anything after she'd said anything to me, and it, it kind of seemed like, you know, she just just wasn't going to say anything. And just to go to show you how Jesus is and how Jesus loves people, Ricky got on the bed as well, and he reached up and he kissed Mom, and he, he said, Mom, he said, I, I, I love you. I just want you to know that I love you, Mama. Mama opened her eyes up just as big as anything and said, I love you too, son. Now, I'm going to tell you something. See, I, I, I didn't need to hear that. Neither did my sisters, and neither did my baby brother, Timmy. But Ricky needed to hear that. And at, at the foot of Mother's bed, I, I had never witnessed such an awesome power of God in all of my life. We were going back and forth around uh, from my baby brother to my aunts and my sisters, and we were praying for Mother. And the one thing that I'd noticed is, is that, you know, the things that we were praying for, we, we were praying and thanking the Lord for Him being so merciful and for Him being so wonderful and so gracious to Mother 
and so gracious to bless us with a person in our life like that for a mother. But nobody had prayed that the Lord take her. You know, I'd felt the Lord so strong in that room, it's like I couldn't move to the left or the right, that the, that the presence of the Lord was there, manifesting himself. And um, the, the time that I'd said, Lord, thank you for her. But Lord, she, she's homesick for heaven. Lord, take her. And just the minute, I mean, it, it was like that. My aunt said, which was on the bed with her, holding her hand, said, well, you must, said she's gone. All the way down to the very end, my mother still continued to believe that, that the Lord was going to heal her. And that Tuesday morning, he definitely did. He healed her where she'd never feel no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears, because she was going to be in Beulah land with him. I'm kind of homesick. Where I've never been before No sad goodbye Will there be spoken For time won't mother was homesick for heaven then I mean I really did I I think more than anything else in the world she was so uh, distressed over you know my brother Ricky and her wanting to make sure that everything was taken care of with him and, and to make sure that uh, he was on the straight and narrow for the Lord and and knowing you know how, how any parent that sees this I, I know the feeling that they're getting and the feeling they can get because I'm a parent as well. And, and, and you want to see your children saved. Playing with the country music group Shenandoah. You know, we got a chance to, to get out in front of a lot of people. And 
the platform in which God had de delivered me to. You know, I, you know, I was kind of like Jonah in the whale. You know, uh, the Lord supplied the place for, for Jonah to go to Nineveh. Well, Jonah didn't want to go, but the Lord also supplied a fish. And Jonah was going to go to Nineveh. So he was swallowed up by the fish, and the Lord spit him out in Nineveh. We don't stand before people that's come to a Shenandoah show and preach to them. That's not what they come there for. But we try to minister to them in our music and just with our spirit try to uh, convey to them, you know, how the Lord does love them. You know, without, without getting in and saying, you know, that fellow, he's gone to preaching to me, you know. Because the thing about it is, is the Lord has got to deal with somebody, you know, and the person has got to deal with the Lord. You know, we're not there to, to, to try to convince people how rotten they're doing because that's not our place to do that. But it is for us to, to spread the good news, and that is the gospel of Christ, that he loved us enough that he died for us. Quite a few people were really surprised at the tremendous walk with the Lord that Sawyer Brown has, even J.D. Sumner, who shares a recent experience. I just sort of wanted to speak because I... I know some of the boys who wanted to speak to them, and uh, before the show started, uh, they told me that they were having their Bible study before a concert, and uh, it blew my mind that a country group would be having a Bible study uh, at such a close time as to, uh, when you start to start a concert, there's a lot of things that goes on in your mind, but those boys were in there studying the Bible, and uh, there's a lot of that in country music, and, and the thing about that is they can reach people that we never can reach. I mean, uh, right. the people that come to hear them is one that needs to hear it. And uh, it's, it's gonna be the next biggest thing uh, in ministering about Jesus Christ as country music. Many fans have been able to pick up on what makes these boys different. They shared their story with us on the set of their video for The Carpenter's Son. And people have come up and, and said to me, um, you're a Christian, aren't you? They said, we, we could just tell. And, that, and that's a nice thing. You, you know, when uh, hopefully God puts, puts those kind of, um, or, or brings those kind of things out of you without you having to stand up and, and say that. And, and, and I know they've, they, 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 they've said things to Hobie before, and, and, and those, are, those are the nice, rewards in, in, in kind of a, a silent witness kind of thing. It's really the greatest compliment you can give us, I, th I think, when they've heard something in the music that, that made them feel like there was something positive in our lives that was the springboard for all this other stuff. The, the earliest memories that I have of, of being on earth, I was in church, um, you know, two or three times a week. And when I was 13, I got saved at church camp. And, um, and, I, and I never have, have really looked back since. Uh, there, have been, there have been times in my life where I wasn't as, as close as I should have been, but there was never a time that, that I ever didn't believe. You know, this, this particular business will mess with your head, but you have, you have to know one thing. It's, it's, and, and Hobie kind of touched on this earlier. Hey, you know, you got to look at this is just a job. And, and God needs Christians uh, as teachers. He needs Christian uh, gospel singers, and he needs Christian country music singers and rock and roll singers. And we all can't be preachers, and we all can't be gospel singers. We as a group have gone through tremendous ups and downs, but we've survived, and you're looking at two guys that believe that the reason that we, we survived is, is this where God wants us. I grew up in the Pentecostal church and still belong to the Pentecostal church, and I remember the, the first show that my minister from childhood came to see, Sawyer Brown. When it was over, he came back and he said, well, I see your, your Pentecostal roots have, has affected your, your performance. Because growing up in the church, I mean, we, we literally felt our music. I mean, it, you know, it was nothing that for somebody to get up and shout or, or, or run through the aisle or, or dance or, you know, 
you know, we had full horn sections in the in our bands. We had drums. We had everything, and you know, and and so, um, you know, I learned to let go in the church as as far as playing music, and I and I do that on stage, and and I think maybe sometimes that is a little bit misinterpreted. Most of my family are uh, are in the construction business and are carpenters. And um, my uh, two two of my favorite cousins, um, uh, actually, is his buddy Ross and his son Jason. And um, this particular story is their life. Um, and as soon as I heard this 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 album, um, they were you know they were building a house and I, I called them up and said I got a song I'm going to have to play you guys, so I go I go over and I play in the carpenter song, uh, and um, I can't I can't even tell this, um, I played it for him and Jason who's 21 who's who's a, you know just a real tough kid, you know he just looks up and he just walks out of the room. And and Buddy has has got tears coming down his face, and and Buddy's also the minister of music at his church, and uh, and and Jason came back in a little later and said, "That's my life." They were adding on to the country club, but the company song. Yes, I am a carpenter's son. I work with my daddy till the job gets done. I work with the wood and the hammer and nails. And build with the love that never fades. And then he told them a story that came from above about a man whose only crime was love. And if they nailed him. Said he was the son of an average Joe, but every man would have lost his soul if he hadn't died on Calvary. And yes, he was a carpenter's son. He worked with his dad till the job got done. He worked with the wood and the hammer and nails, and he built with the love that never. Never judge a man by what his job is in order. If you're looking on the outside, it's hard to see just to what is worth. Let this be a lesson for the whole world to see. So when you're talking to a stranger, you never know who it might be. Yes, he is a carpenter's son, working with his father till the job gets done. He worked with the wood and the hammer and nails, and he died on the wood with the hammer and nails. But he builds with the love that never. God, I really believe God wanted us here. Um, when I, when I was in high school, I I couldn't even read out loud. I mean, I, I was so nervous about getting up in front of people. I prayed 
for God to let me do something else other than this. I did not want to, to be a performer. I, I mean, I said, please, God, I, I, I really wanted to write songs, but I did not want to get up and have to get up in front of people and sing. And um, man, it just, you know, the doors kept opening and I just kept saying, I can't do it, I can't handle it. Uh, and you can ask him, when, when we were in high school, we went to high school together, we both had to get up and give a speech. And he got up and cruised to this speech, and man, he looked like 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 the president, man. And I'm get, I got up behind him. I got so nervous. All I could do was say my name, and I turned around and went and sat back down. And I and, thought he was trying to psych me out. <laughs> <laughs> my mom uh, is is a tremendous Christian with a lot of faith, and you know she would she would counsel me from time to time, and and uh, and say. I mean, when I first went to Nashville, I had all the money taken from me, stolen, before I got two hours from home, from Orlando, Florida. By the time I got to Gainesville, I had all the money taken. And I called her up and I said, I don't think God wants me to go to Nashville. I think, because Hobie and I quit when we were seniors in college. I said, I think I'm supposed to come back. And she said, well, maybe it's the devil trying to keep you away. And I said, oh. Thanks, Mom. I didn't really, I didn't look at it like that. When we got to Nashville, we got a production deal the first day we came to town. And, and you know, I mean, we didn't, we didn't get a record deal right away, but, but things would happen along the way that just kept saying, hey, you're supposed to be here. God taught me more the year, first year and a half I was here and worked as a waiter than the three years I spent in college about just plain human kindness. And it probably wasn't until I moved up to Nashville and was completely by myself that I realized how important a, a real personal relationship with God was going to be because I was, I mean, I just knew nobody in town. I had no money. Um, so it was like I, my daily Bible study became like the best part of the day for me. I think God really showed me, you know, all these, all these stories, all these Bible verses that you learn, they're real. It's, it's here for you. It's my gift to you. You know, the, my arms are open. All you have to do is walk over here. The public sometimes thrives on the negatives, and I'm sure that many could tell you about the problems the Gatlin brothers have experienced over the last few years. But we think more people should know about the tremendous ways the Lord has used these adversities to His own good including their most recent success story, a $7.5 million theater on South Carolina's Golden Strand, which they attribute to their recent rededication to the Lord. We talked about their faith, their backgrounds, and the origin of Help Me. You know, I don't know that I came back to the Lord. I don't think I ever left. So maybe our semantics are a little, are a little different. You know, um, I prayed every day that I was doing drugs. You know, so... Uh, what one person's idea of coming back to the Lord or, or whatever, that's, that's not the way I look at it at all. Uh, I, was, uh, I might have had my priorities a little askew, and yes, I did, and I was very sick. But it was not a conscious effort on my part of going out and saying, okay, you, you know, I'm not a Christian anymore, any of that. Uh, the basic faith that kept me through the whole thing was the faith that has part of that to do with church and with the songs that we grew up with, and that whole that whole experience uh, of you know having a Christian mother and father and 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 being raised in the church, so it all stood us in good stead. But uh, it was uh, it was a matter of all along. It, I mean, this is gonna sound weird, but during the, the seven or eight years that that I was goofy and sick, uh, I was doing the best I could that day. You know, so. Uh, God had a plan for all of this, and, uh, and He kept me through that. But, um, yeah, I think it's, it's very definitely a result of the, uh, of the old teaching and the things that I still believe are the truth. When Larry checked in the care unit in December of 84, it uh, made us all look at ourselves and where our lives were individually, as well as the band and the crew and all the people that worked for us. And it let us take a chance to uh, reprioritize our life, so to speak. And as we had kind of put God and the church and everything off to the side, it was very easy in the late 70s, early 80s when we were having all this success to say, look what we've done. Uh, 
we're real talented and we can go out there and sing and play with the best of them and, and all of a sudden we pretty well hit bottom. I think it was a matter of just uh, getting back on your knees and saying thank you God for bringing us through this. We're, we're stronger now because of the fire, uh, but we want to put you back where you really belong as the front, the front piece of our life. I hope we're constantly evaluating our Christian walk and uh, living up to the, the standards that we'd like to live up to and, the, and have the communication, the communion, and the fellowship with our Lord that we, we should have. Just everyday things that uh, can kind of uh, uh, challenge you and uh, kind of uh, test your faith and, uh, and your walk, you know, with the Lord. And uh, we, I try to try very hard. It's, it's tough, but uh, I try to keep that, uh, that walk and I try to keep that communion and that fellowship going. And it's got to have it. It's tough. We have to understand that Christ himself did not live up to the, uh, the high ideals of the religious zealots of his time either. Um, I know what's in my heart, and that is not subject to anyone else's value judgment. Their opinion of me is none of my business. God is my judge. Uh, and he can't see the sins that I commit and the shortcomings that I have through the blood of Jesus. Everything is rolling again for the brothers. Good things are happening to us, and I think it's because we have rededicated our lives and that focus. Um, I think we're right where we're supposed to be, and every night, six nights a week, we get a chance to go out there and share a little good news. We try to share that through our lives and through our walk, through the things that we say and, and the interviews that we do, and uh, sometimes we fail every day. We fail and make mistakes. Larry touched on it a while ago. And um, we're not perfect. We're, we're, we're Christians saved by grace. And if, that, if I understand that correctly, that means that there'll be some grace there for me tomorrow too. And that's, that's rewarding. That's nice to know. Because I'm going to mess up again tomorrow. You know? And, and you, the, the nice thing is, as I tell people when I go out and speak, you don't have to clean up to come to Christ. Just come as you are and let, let Him take care of it. I don't have to go save the world. I just have to save me and whoever I come in contact with. My little influence and my little sphere of influence let me have an influence positively for the kingdom. And if he'll do that and he'll do that, and everybody out there listening do that, this wonderful domino effect will take, take hold. And I think in this particular place, we have a real chance to share the love of Jesus Christ. Another mile, just one more mile. I'm tired of walking all alone. Lord, help me smile. Another smile, just one more smile. I know I just can't make it on my own. I never thought I needed help before. I thought that I. So come down from your golden throne to me, to lowly me. I need to feel the touch of your tender hand. Chains of darkness and let me see, Lord, let me see just where I 
fit into your master Can you please for him? With a humble heart on bended knees, I'm begging you please for Back before uh, I got clean and sober, we sang Help Me, and a lady came up. It was in Maple Leaf Gardens, wasn't it, that we worked that night? I don't know. And uh, she said, and we had sung it that night, and I like to say, this was still when I was sicker than a dog. And she came backstage and she said, I want to thank you for that song. She said, they, uh, they sang that at my two-month-old daughter's funeral, and it helped me get through it. So no, you don't have to pontificate, you don't have to preach, you don't have to help it. It's the old deal, you know, don't worry about the blind mule, just load the wagon. That's what we're doing here, we're loading the wagon. That's our job, uh, that's our calling. Do it, stand up there and do it with conviction and the power and the spirit and it will go and do what it is supposed to go and do. And you can't keep it from happening if you'll do it in the right spirit. That's what we try to do. Choosing my song for this project was real easy because the writers Jeffrey Thurman and Michael Purrier put into words the desire of my heart, and that's to have the mind of Christ. When I was 13 years old, uh, uh, we was at a revival in Blaine, Kentucky at an old uh, Baptist church there, Free Will Baptist Church, and uh, uh, the pastor was give an invitation and uh, and boy I ran down to the altar like I had killed somebody I mean I cried and I cried and I cried you know and now now I know that I was you know that I, I did help to kill somebody I helped crucify the Lord you know because he uh, all the things that he did for me 2,000 years ago on the cross you know I was going there and asking him to forgive me for the sins that I'd, I'd committed the, the things that that held him to the cross you know I had Apparently, a gift, and I, and I know now it was a, it was a true gift of the Lord. Um, when I was very very young, that, that gift was imparted to me. I'm sure even before I was born, like Jeremiah, but, you know, when I was formed in my mother's womb, you know, I mean, the Lord was pouring these gifts into into my life. Um, and now I know they're they're all for His purposes, you know. But uh, you know, it takes years in your life to figure out really, you know, what those things are. But um, these old men of the faith, these old preachers and old prophets uh, in those Baptist churches would would pray over me and, and speak to me and, and, and speak words of the Lord into my life when I was, you know, four and five years old. And they'd say, you're going to be a man of God. You're going to be a singer for God. And, you know, God's going to use your talents. And, you know, and you're not going to miss the mark. And, you know, things like that. And, and uh, those words stayed with me, you know, whether they were in my mind all the time uh, or not, but I know in my in my spiritual self those words stuck and they stayed there and and uh, you know the anointed words of the Lord is strong things you know we we can speak blessing or we can speak curses out of our mouths you know and and uh, I had a whole lot of blessings spoke over me when I was very young. Sometimes just saying I love you means so much it goes so far and it just kind of breaks those walls down and just clears the air you know. And, uh, and that's what the Lord said on the cross. I love you enough to where if you were the only one that believed in me, I would die for just you, you know. And uh, once I realized that kind of love, uh, 
there was nothing that could keep me away from Christ. And so after I went through a divorce, boy, I just, I knew I had to get my life right. And, and, uh, and so I, I rededicated my life. I, I, I was sure, you know, that, that, I, that I needed Christ. And once you're sure that you're lost, and once you're sure that, 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 you, that you really need Christ in your life, it's not hard to make that decision. And so me and Sharon started really seeking the Lord. We started really, I mean, we went to church, we read the Bible, we prayed together. And I didn't have that in my first marriage, you know. And, and, uh, and I just, I knew I needed something uh, that was solid and, sol and something that was real. And, uh, and Jesus became real to us. The Holy Spirit would reveal uh, the person of Jesus Christ to us. And... Uh, and I just really felt so loved by the Father. You know, I felt like I just had so much. I felt like I had favor with Him, you know, somehow. And that I was a real friend to the Lord. And boy, when you, when you feel that, you know, it's, uh, there's nothing. Nothing that you can't do. There's nothing that you can't go through. There's no valleys too deep. There's no mountains too high that you can't climb. Because the Lord is right in front of you pulling you up there. Or He's right behind you saying, go on, go on, I'm with you, go on. I mean, Benny Hinn. And all these great men of God, William Branham from the past, uh, Billy Graham, all these great men of God will tell you that it is nothing in them. There's nothing in them. They don't have the power. They don't have anything other than the power that Jesus gives them and His authority because He's the one that saves us. So that's the, that's the miracle. It's when the Master of Heaven, the Master of the Universe, the same guy that created everything in existence, when He takes time out of His schedule to speak to an individual's heart at a church, or at a bar, or at a Billy Graham conference. That's the miracle. I sing a song called The Mind of Christ. You know, and that's what, that's what I want so much, is I want to have the mind of Christ, to be with one who's all alone, to shield someone that, that throws stones at somebody else, you know, uh, to build up when others want to tear down, you know, uh, to seek the lost until they're found, you know. That's what Jesus, Jesus said, I, I didn't come for, you know, for the, the saved. I came for the, for the lost. I came for the sinners. To receive when others reject, to treat each one with true respect to shield when others throw stones to be with one who's all alone to think and choose to see the very best to live like this is nothing less than to possess the mind of Christ, my highest goal, the Lord's delight, the desire of my soul, the Father's heart will always my life if I will have in me the mind of Christ to build up when a When others boast to sacrifice my all without regret, to live like this is nothing less than to possess the mind of Christ, my highest goal. desire of my 
That's what I love about this whole project, Silent Witness, that we're doing. It's not just, you know, gospel people, and it's not just country people. You know, it's people that love God. You know, no matter what walk of life we're in, and no matter if we're working at Kroger's, if we're working at, you know, Winn-Dixie, uh, if we're working at, uh, you know, at a tire company, if we're working at a, you know, at a, uh, at a gas station, we need to show forth Jesus Christ. We go to church to get build up to get our batteries charged up. You know, where the real war is and where the real effectiveness is, is out in the world. That's where we need to be that witness. You know, and sometimes we're silent and sometimes we're not, you know. And, uh, you know, when I first heard about this project, I thought, silent witness. Now, well, I'm not too silent, but maybe I should be more silent sometimes, you know, because I know there have been times that I have, you know, uh, maybe preached or maybe come off a little too strong in, in, a, in a place where I should have had a little more wisdom, you know, and used more discernment. I was like a kid with a butcher knife. I was going out and, and just attacking this and attacking that and, you know, I was, I was speaking out against abortion and I was speaking out against homosexuality and I was speaking out against, you know, immorality and, you know, uh, everything that was, that was bad and, and contradictory you know, to the word of, of the Lord, I was, I was against, you know. And I know that I was, uh, I was trying to sing to people that live that way, you know. And, you know, those people that live that way, they know down deep in their heart they're wrong. They know that they're living wrong. And for me to come up and tell them that they're living wrong was wrong. That's not my place. My place is to tell them about the one that's right. His name's Jesus. He's the only one that can change those hearts. He's the only one that can move into someone's heart and change homosexuality. He's the only one that can restore a woman back just like she was a virgin and never had an abortion. He's the only one that can do that. I can't do it. I can lead someone to that. But if I, if I rub salt into a wound, I'm just going to push those people farther and farther and farther away. But if I speak blessing and I speak grace and I, and I, and I rub oil and love into that wound and I can bring someone closer to where I can touch them or put my arms around them and tell them how much the Lord loves them. See, that's our, that's our job. That's our witness is how much do you really love. And I think when we get to heaven, that's going to be one of the things that God's going to say to us is, okay, turn around there and let me take a look at you and just see how much of my son I can see in you. If I had a word to say to new Christians, especially in country music, don't stop playing country music. God's given you a platform where you are. Take, take Jesus into the clubs. Take Jesus into the casinos. Take Jesus wherever you go. He is not ashamed to go anywhere that you want to take him. It also came as a big surprise to most of the people associated with this project what a powerful testimony Marty Stewart has. His faith has already touched many of the crew and technicians on silent witness. We had the unique opportunity to attend his family reunion down in Philadelphia, Mississippi, where Marty, along with Jerry and Tammy Sullivan, performed for the very first time the song they wrote especially for this project, Let Me Be a Witness. This church is Old Pearl Valley Baptist Church in Neshoba County, Philadelphia, Mississippi. And it's my home church, and this is the first place I ever remember hearing about Jesus and Moses and Noah and Daniel 
and Job and Esau and all those people that I love in the Bible. And uh, I know my mama told me before I was born that I was dedicated to Jesus and the kingdom. And uh, so I really don't know of a time in my life that I did not totally believe, trust, love, and hope that Jesus was in me because I knew he was all around me. And at times his grace has sustained me when uh, I didn't have enough respect for myself and love for myself or strength to walk the holy path with any, you know, with any fervence. And this church means so much to me. And there's been times that I have literally come in off the road. They hardly ever locked the doors here. I'd come in off the road from a hard, you know, bunch of uh, months on the road and literally walk in that door by myself in the middle of the day and crawl to this altar and beg God to keep me going, keep me from dying, keep me going. And the grace that he, uh, the, and looking back, that he gives us, but he's, especially through rough times that he gave me, uh, and it goes back to that very first time. And it teaches me that once you are his, nobody can take you away. And it's, it's a fierce war out there between darkness and light to, to pull you away. But I know that once you're his child, nothing else can have you. And that gives me a whole lot of comfort. And the joy that comes from knowing that my Heavenly Father knows my name and, and loves me. And he has my name in his book. That's so wonderful to me. And the kind of music that we love writing and the things that we love talking about, I love going, when Jerry and me talk about writing songs, when we pray to God for songs, we pray that it goes beyond denomination, beyond any yes. religions, but it gets down into the core of that spiritual being of that heart, and that it, it inspires and uplifts people and gives them the courage to go that one extra mile, that one extra step, that one extra day. And to me, that's what gospel music is about. And that is what a true walk, what the Lord is about me, is that trusting for that next step. And you don't know where he's going to take you. But I, I'm at that point in my life, I don't care where I go with him just as long as I'm with him. <laughs> you know? yes, I don't do. care where he leads me as long as I know that I'm under his will and under his grace. I'm really becoming to believe that there's nothing that happens by chance if God's in it. And it was pointed out to me, Connie Smith told me one time, if God's in something, he's not in it halfway, he's in it all the way. The first music, uh, commercial music performance I ever went to see in my life was in Jackson, Alabama. It was the old Sullivan family gospel singers. And Uncle Jug here was uh, playing the bass with them. And Bill Monroe was on the show, and it was an all gospel sing. And that night after that, he sang, he stayed in the background and played a bass. But they finally let him come up to the microphone. He said, I'd rather be on the inside looking out than to be on the outside looking in. He just had that <laughs> glow about him, man, that joy. He just came out and tore my heart up. And after the deal was, and he encored it and he sang, Oh, my life was filled with darkness. Couldn't see the light of day. <laughs> the Savior was... Yes. What's the words? I, I, the boy again. Yeah, my life was filled with darkness. Could not see the light of day. I was burdened down with sorrow when I heard my Savior say, "Come to me, my yoke is easy, and you'll find my burden light. If you trade the downward pathway, trade the long way for the right." That's right. And he says, "At the old country church, I repented of my sins. I had a born again experience. Felt the love of God within." And I took a stand for Jesus, and I'm going, going all the way. I want to hear him say, well done, my faithful servant on, on that day. day. So I had to buy that record at the end of that show. <laughs> and he came up to me, and he was, I said, I want you to sign my record, Uncle Jerry Sullivan. He said, you want to be a picker, don't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, you can do it. And God put us together at that moment, and through all of our trials and all of our changes and all of our failures, victories, and successes, the one thing that we keep doing, we're, we're prayer partners. And we're eternal prayer partners. Yes. And God has put us together in that way. He's given us so many songs. You wouldn't believe the darkness and the things he's lifted us up out of. So uh, he loved me when nobody else would, would carry my bag, you know. Yeah. And uh, now we're finally getting a chance to talk about it for a lot yes. of people. And, and he'd come alive with that music. And uh, like, like I said, when I come on to uh, sing, he was there. You know, you could see that I want to do it look in his face, you know, <laughs> and uh, he, he did, he come on there, and, and he was just a little fellow that it was easy to, to love and like, you know, and we become friends that night, just like he said, and, and that joy 
that was in that song right there is uh, the last verse of that song is so strong to me. And when it says, oh, Satan's chains were broken when he saved my soul that night. Uh, I, walk I walk no more in darkness. Thank God I saw the light. There's a joy <laughs> down deep inside me like a fountain overflowing. <laughs> And there's a greater joy awaiting me in that city where I'm going. <laughs> See, it is a joyous walk. The joy, if you lose the joy in your salvation, it's gone, my That's friend. Right. There's something wrong. we got to go redo something. Right. So I've walked with that joy in my life, even though when things uh, go down around me, uh, I find a certain peace in the Lord that I can go to and, and just, and we've done it together before, just shut ourselves out. And say, Lord, it, it don't look good around us right now, but knowing you, there's a joy that knowing that because I know you that everything is going to be all right, even though it don't look like it is, it is because y the things that look like they are wrong, he makes right because if you are obedient to him, there's nothing he'll withhold from you. And once you find that out, that joy leaps right back in your life. And it don't make any difference where you're at. You're going to smile. And you're going to look around and you're going to see. And you're going to uh, carry that smile. And people, it's catching. People are want to walk with you because you're happy. And there's only way, one way for you to be happy. And that's to find it in Christ. And I don't, uh, 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 there's no such thing as a sad Christian. Something's wrong in his life. If he, he, uh, I don't mean he might not be, uh, he may be a Christian, but he's turned the wrong way some way or another. And somebody needs to steady his hand and show him where the joy, get back, the joy back in his life. He's okay then. Some people preach the gospel in a mighty way. Some people serve the Lord one word to say, but I believe you have to live it before you ever give a friend to need the bread of life that will surely save his soul. Lord, let me be a witness in this world of darkness. Let me shine, let me shine, let me shine. Pour heaven's light down through me. I pray that you can use me. Let me shine, let me shine, let me shine. To that promised land Lord, let me be a witness In this world of darkness Let me shine, let me shine, let me shine Oh, heaven's light down through me I pray that you can use me Let me shine, let me shine, let me shine the gospel every night and day. I shout it from the mountaintop so the word can hear me say. Holy is my Savior. He is the one that gives me the power and the grace to overcome. Lord, let me be a witness in this world of darkness. Let me shine, let me shine, let me shine. Oh, heaven's light down through me. I pray that you can use me. Let me shine, let me shine, let me shine. Let me 
shine, let me shine, let me shine. Let me shine, let me shine, let me shine. Shine, 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 shine. I love the word a silent witness because that really hits me and sometimes what I appear to be. Yes. And we talked about people that proclaim it and preach it and knock people over the head with it and run people off. And then some people actually uh, don't say a word and get more done than those kind yes. of people with it. It just depends on the personality. And I was sitting in the bus one night thinking, some people preach the gospel in a mighty way. Some people serve the Lord without a word to say. But I believe you have to live it before we ever give a friend to need the bread of life that will surely save their soul. Then the course popped out. And I called Jerry and Tammy and told them, I said, what do you think about this project? And they liked it. And I sang him. He said, oh, I love it. And Tammy went home. So he turned. He said, call me back in a minute. Put it on my coat of phone. <laughs> so I sang a verse and a course just with my guitar into the telephone and left it on their coat of phone. And he called me back. He said, I've got two more verses for you. Yeah. And I wanted it to be the kind of song. I could sing a verse. Jerry and Tammy could sing a verse. And I, and I love the appeal of this project, uh, A Silent Witness, because I think what this is is a vehicle here for people like me and other people on this tape who actually would love to say something about their faith but normally don't get asked. And I think it's a great opportunity. I had started, started in Nashville when I was 13 years old. I had a great job with Lester Flat, and was on top of the world up to, and I hit, from 1972 till about 1987. I went through a divorce, a sour record deal, and just all the good things disappeared. Yes. And I was left like a stray dog. And it was really tough on me, really, really tough on me. That record that we talked about earlier that I bought in that concert, I had nothing to do. I hadn't had a call in two years for my services as a musician. Out of nowhere one day, me and my mom were at her house and I was going through old records. I played Born Again Experience, and my mother can tell you. Within an hour, the phone rang. And it was these folks saying, you know where we can get a mandolin player for this weekend? I said, I think I do. <laughs> God called, and then that's when this whole thing we're talking about started back yes. together. And when I went down there, I'd been through a lot of the big time. I mean, I'd seen the big time, and I saw the, the way that they were, and I knew that if, if people could just hear them, and people could just get that feeling, that same unconditional love and that joy that they gave me, I thought if we can get this out to a bigger audience and to more people, and God's going to help us do it. And God says, you are appointed to do this. I said, God, I don't even have a record deal. And selling some unknown gospel bluegrass singers when I get back to town with these little rough tapes. And we spent three years praying, crying, yes. trying, and we're still struggling. But you know what? Every mile, I love that song Howard Goodman had, I don't regret a mile, I've traveled for the Lord. Yeah, and I man. love that. You know what else I love about these songs we've done? I have a gold record, I have platinum records, I have awards on my shelf, and that's really nice. And I'm, yeah. and I'm headed toward being on first name basis for the universe. And that's, that's good stuff. I mean, that's just a good game to play. I enjoy that game. But these songs that we've written, I've actually seen them truly change lives, make a difference yes. in people's lives. And I hear that we're going to get one of our songs put in a hymn book now. And I don't think that there's any award I could ever achieve that would top the fact that I have a song and a hymn book that we've written together. And that's amazing to me. And I would trade everything that I've accomplished in country music for knowing that I helped save one soul. Johnny Cash has been a true man of God for so long that we felt the best way to honor him would be to choose two songs which truly represent the faithfulness that he's had over the years. After comments by James Blackwood and Marty Stewart, we take a brief look at John's life and the lives that he's touched, beginning with Were You There, recorded in 1962 with June Carter and the Carter family, and ending with his most recent offering, Redemption, from an album that is reaching a whole new generation of young people. A few years ago, I recorded a song on a solo album that Johnny Cash had written called Over the Next Hill We'll Be Home. And I didn't know that he knew that I had recorded it, but a few months after that, I had a letter from Johnny so James, when I was still on the farm over in Arkansas, that I would come in from the field every day in, in time to hear your broadcast, the Blackwood Brothers broadcast on a Memphis radio station. said, never did I dream that one day I would write a song that you would record. 
Johnny Cash is a man that I love very much. I mean, God put him in my mind in my life when I was five years old. And I've never ceased to be a Johnny Cash watcher, I think is what somebody said one time. Uh, he has a new album out. It's called Cash. And I hadn't heard him make a record in years and years. And I heard he was doing this one, just him and his guitar, just song and guitar. And I thought, well, that's great because I can finally hear what's on his mind. And when I... I I sat down one night and listened to his new album, and I thought, I see the job. He's the only guy I know that can take his songs and his life and the message of sin and redemption into the Viper Room in L.A. or the Hollywood Bowl or the Madison Square Garden, just basically wherever he goes, wherever God sends him. And I think he can sit there with the authority that, hey, I've messed up more times than you have. I've come from the bottom a whole lot more than you have. God's shown me more mountaintops than you have, but at the same time, I'm flesh and blood like you are. But I've got all that going for me. But the, other, the thing that I really have going for me is a walk with God that you can't contest. He's a powerful man of God. Were you there? When they crucified my Lord Oh, were you there When they crucified my Lord Old, living on a little farm in northeast Arkansas, little town of Dias, a community. I remember my father had said to me that I had reached the age of accountability, and I knew what that meant. We were having a revival at the church my parents belonged to. So one night, along in the revival, they were singing that old hymn, Just As I Am. And I walked down that aisle and took the preacher's hand and accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Down through the years, wherever I've traveled, wherever I've gone, oftentimes when the way has been hard for one reason or another, my mind and my heart has returned to that time in that little town in Arkansas and that particular night at that church and I hear that song again, and I go back down that aisle in my heart. And it's a wonderful, easy little trip every time I make that journey. And the years have rolled by, and it's still in my heart and mind that simple. My commitment to God is just as simple today as it was then. I walked down the aisle and I accepted Jesus Christ. And throughout all these years, God has accepted me. He's corrected me because, like everyone, I needed correcting. But God has never turned his back on me, never turned away from me. 
He's always been there, sometimes through people like you, like my mother. So I've been very careful not to complicate the plan of salvation, but I see that through the eyes of about 50 years now, that little time. And I was thinking about that and contemplating that, that redemption. Even at an early age, there was redemption and salvation and then all of the joy that follows and down through the years, all of the joy that still comes from knowing that and feeling that and know that I have salvation through Jesus Christ, through his blood. And then my last work, my last album, I wrote a song about it. It's called Redemption. From his hands it came down, from his side it came down, from his feet it came down and ran to the ground. Between heaven and hell a teardrop fell in the deep crimson dew. The tree of life grew And the blood gave life To the branches of the tree And the blood was the price That set the captives free And the numbers that came Through the fire and the flood Clung to the tree And were redeemed by the blood Streamed the light that started the fight. Round the tree grew the vine on whose fruit I could dine. My old friend Lucifer came, fought to keep me in chains, but I saw through the tricks of 666. And the blood gave life. To the branches of the tree And the blood was the price That set the captives free And the numbers that came Through the fire and the flood Clung to the tree And were redeemed by the blood From his hands it came down From his side it came down from his feet it came down and ran to the ground. Then a small inner voice said, you do have a choice. The vine engrafted me and I clung to the tree. And the blood gave life to the branches of the tree. And the blood was the price that set the captives free with the numbers that came through the fire and the flood i clung to the tree and was redeemed by the blood I'd like to ask those of you who can, support this project in prayer. Help us make the words that's spoken on this tape a reality. That God will use country music as a tool to bring millions to know His Son. Thank you for being a part of this very special project. One that we plan to continue with other country artists very soon. Until next time, God bless you. There's two songs that Jerry and I were written that God gave us that I think go in deeper and I've seen it move more lives and change, really change people's lives. One is a song when Jesus passed by and the other was a song that I'm particularly fond of the way Tammy sings is called At the Feet of God. There is a place I go to rest at the feet of God. There is a place where I'm blessed at the feet of God. What's the next? Sing a little bit. And there are times when I'm weak at the feet of God. You know, and it's, the, it's the, at that point where I put myself in that song and I think, yeah, there's lots of times when I'm weak. And, and I know that I can go to the feet of God. I can come, come at His feet and He comforts me. And, you know, there's safety from the raging storm at the feet of God. The love that keeps me from all harm is at the feet of God. And a healing power flows for me at the feet of God. His blood will cleanse and make me free 
at the feet of God, and he knows my name, and my soul is clean. You know, I feel I'm such a, a nobody, but he knows my name, and he knows me, and my needs are important to him. And he can comfort me, like I say, when I, when there's nobody else I can talk to or I can speak to, he's there for me. And so that's the reason that that song means so much to me is because it's so real. And I, and I just feel every word of it because every word of it is so true and is such a witness to me. You're cold and you ain't got no coat. I'm on clothes now and right now in a few minutes. So we got a we got a, a bunch of people you're preaching to them and uh, I'm 77 years old and I'm fixing to stand up and I don't know whether I can get 10 steps or not because I'm froze over here sitting here preaching. And uh, I'm gonna say good night to everybody out there and uh, I hope all of you can get to hear me and if you love me, pray for me. If you hate me, uh, then I love you. See. Because I don't know of nobody that hates me. Not even my wife. <laughs> but if I found out some of them did, it wouldn't stop me because I'm on my way to Beulah Land. You see what I'm talking about? <laughs> the love of God.